Bruchem Aboyim. Again, thank you for attending. Welcome to our home. Again, this week we're going to continue with the series on a uh, deeper understanding of the Amnita. Uh, this is the third lecture, uh, even though this will be uh, on the second blessing. Okay, let us begin. So this week on my thoughts, um, let us examine the second blessing in the Amnita, referred to as Atal Gibor, translates to mean you are mighty. This blessing alludes to Yitzchak Avinu, Isaac our father, who was willing to give up his life to serve his creator. God Almighty had requested from his father Avram Avinu that he bring his son Yitzchak up as, on a sacrificial altar. This prayer constitutes a re reaffirmation of our belief in what we call Techiat HaMesim, the revival of the dead. The Rambam stated in Mishnah Torah, Hilchas Tshuva, that the following individuals have no portion in the world to come. And one of those that he mentions are those who deny the resurrection of the dead. God's might is displayed by him sustaining all life forms in this world. Though the, for the most part, he operates this world through his agents, uh, heavenly angels. There are four essential blessings that God Almighty directs personally. The tour in Orachim states that the Hebrew word Mafteach, which means key, which is an allusion to these four blessings. The Hebrew letters that make up this word are Mem, Pe, Tof, and Chet. These letters form an acronym for the word Motor, Rain, Parnosa, Livelihood, Techia, Resurrection, and Chaya, Childbirth. Now, the keys to resurrection, rain, and sustenance are all mentioned in this prayer, but childbirth is not. So the Torah explains that the word matir, the words matir asurim, the one who releases the bound, alludes to a mother who was confined by chevle leda, the bonds of childbirth. And these words also allude to the fetus that has been imprisoned in the womb and is now being released. The Torah stated that this blessing contains 51 words, which is the exact number of words found in the four scriptural verses that refer to God's keys. 51 is also the gematria, the miracle value of the Hebrew word no, which means please. The Chido writes that I heard from the earlier sages that when Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, was in heaven receiving the Torah, that it was revealed to him that if the word no is used twice in a prayer, then one can be certain that God Almighty will always answer their prayer in the affirmative. The Talmud in the Tractate of Shabbos states that Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, was seen as the one true father of the children of Israel. The Talmud says that when God Almighty approaches Avraham and Yaakov with a complaint that their children had rebelled grievously against him and that he must destroy them, both of them answered that if they had sinned grievously, then he should destroy them. However, when God approaches Yitzhak with the same exact words, Yitzhak replies, my children and not your children? In the end, he says to God, I too had a wayward son. I loved him. You should do the same. The prayer opens with the words, Ato gibra li olam adenai. You are eternally mighty, my Lord. The eighth Yosef writes that human might is really short-lived, whereas God's might is eternal, it never diminishes. In this prayer, we are extolling God's greatness in both creating and sustaining life. The prayer continues with the words, Machayim Mesim Ato, you resurrect the dead. Now, even though there have been instances in history where a human being resurrected the dead, we see that with Eliyahu, Elijah, who did it once, Elisha did it twice, and Yechezkel, who actually resurrected a whole valley of dry bones. Nonetheless, we acknowledge that no human being could accomplish such a feat independent of the power of God Almighty, who is the sole progenitor of life. And that continues with the words, Rav Lahoshia, great to help. All of God's actions demonstrate his desire to help and bestow kindness on all of his creations. In the Talmud and the Tractate of Megillah, Rabbi Yochanan declares that the universe has two functions. First, to teach mankind the greatness of the Creator, 
and also to bestow kindness on all that he, God Almighty, has created. Next, the prayer offers two season, seasonal options during the winter months. That is from the Musaf of Amida of Shemini Atzeris until the Musaf of Amida of the first day of Pesach. You recite the words, Ma Shiv Haruach Geshem, which means he causes the wind to blow and the rain to fall. Then during the summer months, from the Musaf Amida of the first day of Pesach throughout the Shachar Amida of Shemini Atzeris, you recite just two words, Morid Hato, he causes the dew to descend. The change from rain to dew is connected to the agricultural season in the land of Israel, since rain during the harvest season would spoil the crops in the field, whereas dew is beneficial. The Talmud in the Tractate of Tainus states that the day of rainfall is even greater than the day of the resurrection of the dead. Since the future revival will only be for the righteous, whereas the rains fall for both the righteous and the evil people alike. It is the rain that causes the seed buried in the ground to rot, so to speak, to die. And then it germinates and produces a beautiful plant. Again, this is an allusion to Tchiat Tamesim, the revival of the dead. Rain is, in a sense, the sperm of creation that descends to unite to become one with Mother Earth. Next it continues with the word Machal Kel Chaim Bechesed. He sustains the living with kindness, meaning that he supplies the needs of all things that are living, as it states in the Talmud and the tract at Ipsachim, that supplying a person's food is as difficult for God Almighty as the splitting of the Red Sea. You know, God could have sustained us with the food similar to the man, the spiritual food that fell from heaven daily for the Jewish nation as they traveled in the desert. Though the man had the ability to taste like anything that one wanted, in the end, it still looked like man. Instead, God Almighty supplies us with foods that have various colors, aromas, and textures, all with different tastes, sweet and sour, spicy, hot, etc., so that we can enjoy eating, not only with our mouths, but also with our eyes. Next it states, Machayim Mesim Barachim Im Rabim. He resurrects the dead with great mercy. The Talmud that tracted his Sanhedrin compares the human body without a soul to a robust person who is blind, while the soul without a body is likened to a sharp-sighted, crippled individual. Individually, each is immobilized by their handicap, but when the sharp-eyed cripple is placed on the back of the strong blind man, well, together, they can do anything and go anywhere that they wish. Similarly, the body can accomplish nothing until the soul enters and guides it to achieve its ultimate purpose. When the body and the soul are separated by death, well, they both suffer, since each cannot be fully affected without the other. At the time of the Tchiat Tamesh and the resurrection of the dead, God Almighty will exercise abundant mercy and reunite them together once again so that they can resume their symbiotic relationship. You know, our sages tell us that sleep is considered to be one sixtieth of death. That being the case, when we wake up from a night's sleep, we are in some way experiencing a form of revival of the dead. We go to sleep dead tired. And somehow when we wake up, we are totally refreshed. We feel like a new person, which is the reason that immediately after we arise in the morning, we perform the ritual of Natilat Yedoyim, the washing of our hands. This act is performed so that we can remove the impurity of death that still lingers on our fingertips after a night's sleep. The prayer continues with the words, Somek Noflim, Barofei Cholim, Umatir Asurim. He supports the fallen heals the sick, and releases the confined. The Talmud in the Tractate of Sanhedrin teaches us that people who were physically handicapped at the time of their death will be brought back to life with the same handicaps that they endured while they were alive. However, immediately after they emerge from their graves, then God Almighty will cure them. The Raiva contends that when the dead come back to life, their bodies will be stronger and healthier than they ever were before. 
It will become impervious to fatigue, illness, or harm. Their bodies will be similar to angels that reside in the celestial realm. So even in the future, God Almighty will continue to support the fallen, heal the sick, and release those that were confined by physical infirmities, just as he has done for all of humanity that have resided in this world. The following words state, Mekayim emunoso lisheni afor. And he fulfills his faithfulness to those who are asleep in the dust. You know, not all of our sages agree as to whether everyone will be resurrected during the period of the revival of the dead. The Rambam, Maimonides, states that the resurrection will only include those who live the righteous life. However, the Barbanel disagrees, and he states that the resurrection will include all of mankind. The Talmud in the Tractate of Shabbos states that there are exceptionally righteous individuals whose bodies do not decompose in the grave. They are merely asleep in the dust. So Rav Nachman asked, what about the curse that God Almighty issued to all the descendants of Adam, first man, after he ate from the tree of knowledge, as it states in the portion of Genesis and Bereshit, as it states, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So Rabbi Acha explained that for the righteous, that curse will take effect just before the final resurrection begins. At that time, they will momentarily revert back to dust. Then in an instant, God Almighty himself will open up their graves and restore them to eternal life. Rabbi Victor Miller stated that God will maintain his faithfulness to resurrect even those graves that have been lost and whose bodies have disintegrated. Some people died by drowning. Others were eaten by wild animals. Some were cremated and their ashes were scattered, leaving no identification. Nevertheless, God is faithful. He keeps an account of every molecule of dust and ashes that comprises a human body, and he will collect them all despite the passage of thousands of years. Our sages tell us that there is a minuscule bone that resides in the body called the loose bone. This bone is indestructible. Today we know through science that one human cell in our body has the whole DNA blueprint of who we are. So now it doesn't seem so far-fetched that God Almighty would have the tools and the ability to recreate mankind with the resurrection of the dead. The prayer continues with the words, who is like you, our master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you? The H. Yosef stated that there have been prophets that have resurrected the dead and performed wondrous deeds, but none, none can compare to God Almighty, the master of mighty deeds. All that these individuals were able to do was only in their capacity as an agent of God Almighty. Those people that God Almighty will resurrect will live on for eternity. Those people that were resurrected by holy individuals all eventually died again. There are powerful rulers and celestial bodies like the sun, which sends its rays of light to all corners of the earth. Yet in the presence of God Almighty, they are all nothing. Every power that they possess has been given to them from him. He is the originator of all that exists. Without him, nothing else can survive. The next statement is, Melech <clears throat> the king who brings death and restores life. Both life and death are in the hands of God Almighty. He brings death into this world and restores life in the next world. Every day, people are simultaneously dying and being born. This is connected to the saying by King Solomon in Pohelet in Ecclesiastes that states, the sun rises and the sun sets. So the Medrash comments on these words and states that it is an allusion to the cycle of life and death. The Talmud and the Tractate of Kedoshim stated that before the sun of one righteous individual sets, death, God causes another sun, another righteous individual, to rise, life. This is orchestrated by God Almighty so that the world would not be left with a spiritual void. As it states that on the same day the Rebbe Kiva died, 
<coughs> excuse me, Rabbi Hurhan Nasi was born. The Kedis Yitzhak stated that this was also true for our matriarchs, Sora and Rivka. The opening words in the portion of Chai Sora form an acronym of the letters Shin, Mem, and Shin, which spell out the Hebrew word Shemesh, sun. This is an allusion to the fact that Rivka's sun could not rise until Sora's sun set. Rivka's birth was predicated on Sora's death. The prayer continues with Umatzmiach Yeshua and causes deliverance to spring forth. The word Matzmiach is derived from the Hebrew word Someach, which means to grow. When a farmer puts a seed into the ground, it appears that nothing happens. However, he has faith that eventually a plant will emerge. So too, we should know with complete faith that all of our prayers will be answered. Though we are not always able to recognize all the goodness that God our Father in Heaven does for us every moment of the day, still, he is constantly in attendance, even when we don't feel his presence. This can be compared to a seed that is hidden in the ground, which is constantly developing until the time when it's ready to reveal itself to the world. <clears throat> so too with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. So let us hope that the day is close when he will reveal himself to the whole world with the coming of Mashiach. Then all souls will be allowed to spring forth from their graves to experience eternal life. Next, the prayer states, V'namon ato v'hachiyot mesim, that you are faithful to resurrect the dead. The Avudraham stated that we mention God's power to restore life three times daily in this blessing. These allude to three kinds of revival. First, by a person waking up each day fresh and renewed. Then rain, which sustains all of life. And finally, the resurrection of the dead may come quickly in our time. The prayer concludes with the words, Baruch atah Hashem v'chayeh ha-meitim. Blessed are you, Hashem, who resurrects the dead. The Ian Tefillin notes that if you count every separate reference to the resurrection in this blessing, they would equal five times. The Devorim Rabbah says that the soul is comprised of five distinct spiritual levels. They are the nefesh, the spirit or action, ruach, the wind or emotion, <clears throat> neshama, the soul or intellect, chaya, meaning the live one, and the last and loftiest level, yechida, the one and only. Now the first three levels reside within our body, whereas the last two levels hover above us, much like a halo. Since these levels have no direct contact with our bodies, they always remain pristine and unblemished. They are in constant connection to God. This is the reason why any ten Jewish men, regardless of the level of their observance, can be counted for a minyan, a religious quorum of men, for a communal prayer. Of all the mighty acts that God performs, the question becomes, why was it that the revival of the dead was chosen for the conclusion of this blessing? Rabbi Miller answers that it is the greatest of God's kindnesses, in addition to being the sole purpose of all of his kindnesses. Being that the revival of the dead will happen in the future, then why do we thank God now in the present tense? Well, by thanking God now in the present tense, we are testifying to the fact that we trust that he will bring about this great kindness. Nurturing that belief is a mitzvah. Once we witness his salvation, while well, that mitzvah no longer exists. There is a reason as to why this prayer is connected to Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, since he actually may have experienced the revival of the dead firsthand. There's a medrash that states that Yitzhak was, if not killed at the Akedah, that he was at least injured by his father as he was bound on the altar. The Torah does not mention his name after the event of the Akedah. This may be so since, according to those opinions that he was injured, he spent the next two years in heaven recovering. This would explain how Yitzhak was able to detect the smell of Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, when Yaakov, his son, entered when he took the blessing from Esau, his brother. You know, the Muslims understand the power of Yitzhak. If you visit the Machpelah, 
in the city of Hebron today. On the Jewish side, you can pray by the graves of Avram and Yaakov, our fathers, 600, pardon me, 365 days of the year. However, the casket of Yitzchak is placed on the Muslim side. Jews are only allowed to pray there during the 10 days of repentance. The Muslims understand all too well the power of Yitzchak, our father. So should we. I hope that you have found this lecture interesting and informative. Once again, there's a great deal of information. If in some way this helps you to connect to the prayer and to our Father in Heaven, well, then I've been successful. But let us all pray to God that he brings the war in Gaza to a victorious end, with the defeat of Hamas and the total destruction of all the evil in the world. May he orchestrate the safe return of all the hostages, cure all the sick and injured, comfort the mourners, and bring home safely all the brave IDF soldiers led by Mashiach Tsukeno quickly in our time now. Again, as I always do, again, we thank you for attending, for listening, and again, God should bless you with all that is good. You should be happy, safe, and uh, healthy. Um, if you can, one more time, if you can push the subscribe button, the like button, and share with your friends. Now, there will be no music today, which is, again, out of the norm of what we've been doing. There's always been a musical rendition after this class. But since we are in the nine days, it's not a time for live music. So I won't be playing my guitar today or singing any song. Uh, I thought that what I would do, though, is give a quick idea of the idea of Tisha B'Av, the ninth above, again, the day when both of our temples, the first and second temple, were both destroyed. And the whole nation was exiled to the four corners of the earth. Again, we wait patiently, too patiently, at the time when God Almighty will build the third temple and then Mashiach will come. And during the Tisha B'Av, again, it's the only fast day. There are four fast days that are connected to the destruction of the temple, in addition to uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, the question again becomes, where was God during the times of this destruction? Did he leave us? Where was he? And the answer is that there are the, the four fasts are the fast of the fourth, which is the fast of uh, Shiva Azar Thomas, the seventh end of Thomas. Then there's the fifth chat fast of the fifth, which is Tisha B'Av this month, the ninth above. Then there's Sum Gedalia, the fast of Gedalia, which is right after Rosh Hashanah. And then it finishes off with uh, Sarah B'Tavis, the tenth day of Tavis. If you add the numbers, four and five is nine, seven is sixteen, and ten is twenty-six. If you had the number of these months when these fasts come out, 26 is the gematria, the numerical value of God's name of mercy. Whether we see God or not, God is always there. So we need to know that if we cry out to him, if we ask him, if we beg our Father in heaven, he'll answer our prayers. There are certain restrictions that we have on this day. There are five things that we don't do. Again, we don't eat um, or drink. We don't wash our bodies. We don't anoint our bodies. Um, we... Uh, Again, fast. We wear leather shoes. We do not wear, pardon me, do not wear leather shoes. You can wear a leather yarmulke, a leather belt, a leather jacket. But shoes are considered to be something that are comfortable. So we don't wear leather shoes and we don't have marital relations on tissue bug. Um, again, it's a day where we say extra penitential prayers, but it's a hope, again, that by recognizing the fact that we've lost our tempest and asking God that He should, should return it quickly. That hopefully he'll answer our prayers. There's a quick story told of Napoleon, that Napoleon Bonaparte was going by a shul, a synagogue, on the ninth of all, and he heard wailing coming from the synagogue. And he sent an officer to, in, in, to find out why the Jews were crying. And when the officer came back, he told Napoleon that the Jews are wailing, they're crying for the loss of their temples. Napoleon said, when did that happen? And the officer said, some 1,500 years ago, Napoleon looked at the officer and said, this is a nation that is destined for greatness. This is who we are. To do another lecture right now on Tisha B'Av again would be too long. And in addition, there are two lectures that are called Tisha B'Av on YouTube, on Spotify, and on my website. Again, I'm sure I'm Chabad or And... In addition, there's one on the three weeks. 
And if you, uh, again, would look them up, I'm sure you'll find much information on the day, on the holiday, and some ideas that you could attach to. And in addition, I'd like to just mention that with anything that happens in your life, you're feeling pain, you're feeling, uh, have a loss of someone that's passed on, uh, troubles with dealing with people, uh, dealing with success, all types of topics, and again, prayer. Um, there are lectures, there are 361 lectures on my thoughts. Um, again, anything that you want to attach to, I think you'll find. So even though there's not a musical rendition, look up another lecture. You may find it very interesting. Again, thank you very much for listening. God should bless you. Shabbat Shalom and have an easy fast. Again, we should do this in Yerushalayim or Al-Kodesh with Mashiach. God bless you all. Thank you.